All right, welcome back everybody to the channel. I am off the short term IR, feeling a little bit better today. So I wanted to wanted to talk some Steelers draft, recap the draft haul uh, from the 2023 NFL draft this past weekend. Um, I am joined by one of my good buddies, one of the best football minds out there, Ian Cummings from Pro Football Network. Ian, I appreciate you uh, jumping on here with me, talk some ball. Yeah, yeah, it's been fun. You know, it's even even better now that we actually have results to go off of, right? You know, I can't I can't keep track of how many mock drafts I wrote in the lead up to the draft, but like it, it got to a certain point where I was just like, all right, let's just see what happens. Come on, let's just fast forward. Let's see what happens. And hey, you know, I thought it was a very exciting draft. You know, there weren't too many draft classes that I, you know I, I couldn't get behind completely, right? So, and the Steelers especially, I think, really hit it out of the park. So you know, overall, a lot of talent and a lot of fun fits. Yeah, just before we get into this one, man, like if you guys, you know, have enjoyed my draft content on the channel, um, you know, we just hit 5, 1500 subs. So I appreciate you guys. But if you guys enjoy my draft content, y'all got to go check out Ian on Twitter. I dropped his, uh, his at uh, below in the banner. Y'all check him out, man. This this the next Mel Kuyper Jr., the next Dane Brugler. Uh, this dude, you know, if I spend a lot of time on draft prospects, he he triples, quadruples the amount of players that I watch on a, on a yearly basis. Uh, definitely one of my favorite people. Uh, to talk ball with, um, and I'm I'm glad that he's you know joining me. Uh, talk some Steelers stuff, man. Let's uh let's talk a little bit about Broderick Jones. I mean, we're we're just gonna go through this draft class uh, kind of one by one. I want to get your you know your takes on you know the value, the players, you know how how you think they fit into the um, organization. But you know, give me give me your just your general thoughts on Broderick Jones. And you know, first round pick, the Steelers trading up a couple spots to grab him. What what did you think of that move? Yeah, for sure. You know, I think trading up, especially, you know, we know we've heard that the Patriots were trying to screw over the Jets, right? Trade up for him, you know, kind of leap it. So, you know, the Jets may have targeted him. So in that sense, you know, I can get behind trading up for a guy that you're big on the upside with. I think with Roger right. Jones, you know, the the distinction with him is that, you know, he is very physically talented, right? He's a little more raw than I'd want for a guy. I'm picking at 14th overall. You know, I think sure. the hand usage can still improve a little bit. You don't see independent hand usage in pass pro as much as you'd like. Uh, he does widen his torso a little too much and can be exposed to power Isaiah McGuire Missouri really gave him trouble with that too so but I think you know overall you know all of the building blocks are there to be a blue chip starting tackle and that's why you know especially this early I can get behind making that that judgment call because six foot five 315 he's got 35 inch arms I mean the dude has insane core core strength once he gets his hands on you you know I think that's you know that part of his game was very fun for me because even without independent hand usage without elite independent hand usage you know he's got such good anchor strength when he's able to get his hands on he can just stimmy rushes and suffocate power so and on top of that too you know he's an explosive athlete very good recovery athleticism too but then in the run game I mean that's well advertised I mean he's explosive right. rangy he's a physical finisher right so you know I think the athletic tools that you're looking for that's all there. I think the physical tone setting mentality that you're looking for, that's there too, right? And I look at the tackle position for the Steelers, you know, both left and right side, you're looking at those as positions that you could upgrade. A lot of people thought they might target a right tackle like Darnell Wright if he was there. He obviously wasn't there, but, you know, because Dan Moore did show flashes, right? But I still think there's room to upgrade there. So again, with Broderick Jones, you know, maybe on day one, it'll be a little rocky because he still does need to refine his technique a little more. But the physical tools are all there. The demeanor is there. And those are two very important pro uh, products. Yeah, for sure. With Jones, man, that was definitely something I highlighted in the in the film room aspect that I did of him. You know, just that hand usage really needing to improve. You know, he, he could be a way spender, too. Mm -hmm. uh, but the thing about Jones that I thought was really interesting, man, is like you can tell how a player – like what a player could potentially become when they have bad reps from a technical perspective and they're still winning them against yeah. good competition. That's the and thing, like, man, that core yeah. strength. I swear, like he he's so good at, you know, even when his hands aren't perfect, you know, just the recovery athleticism, again, it's still getting the right spot, right? And just kind of nullify rushes with that strength as well. So, you know, when you see that, you know, that's kind of fun because people will harp on the hand usage and rightfully so, you know, you need to criticize where, where that's due. But at the same time, it's like, man, this guy is this good and he's not even, you know, near his ceiling yet. Right. So from that perspective, projecting up, you can there's reason to be excited. Yeah. Just like, uh, you know, there was reps, man, where like I was seeing, you know, his hands be so poor and like he would he would be really wide and then go to refit. And then as he's refitting, he's basically anchoring with one hand on the defender and still yeah. able to just stall out the bull rush like instantly. And I'm like, dude, this dude's a different type of athlete. Yeah. And you hit on, you know, his ability as a run run blocker. You know, I, I do think that he's a day one kind of ready made NFL run blocker, even if this dude is going to be a little bit of a projection in terms of, you know, as a pass blocker, uh, as a rookie, if he does come in and start, um, 
from the jump. I, I think as a run blocker, you know, he's going to be this guy that's going to be able to set the tone. And what I liked about him too is, you know, Georgia, they got really creative with the things they did with him in the run game. You know, they would get him out in space. They would pull him, mm-hmm. you know, he, when he would get out of the move, man, like this is a dude that is a like runaway freight train. Oh yeah. Dude that just demolishes people. And like and he, he can dude, climb the field. He can stack blocks too. He yes. Got that. And he can, the thing is like, you'll see his eyes be so like in tune and locked in, just switching from defender to defender to threat to threat. And the thing I like about him too, is like normally when you get these big tackles, like even the ones that are athletic, they, um, they don't always, you know, stay balanced and they don't always, you know, stake in control and mm-hmm. jones like he's such a good athlete that he changes direction he's just always looks in control even out in space like that and i i think that that's going to give uh the steelers a lot more options uh in the run game you know? yeah for sure and you know it's fun to think about. i know we'll talk about him more later but it's really fun to think about him and darnell washington in the same offense too man yeah. i mean that amount of run blocking that's fun but yeah you mentioned it i mean even athletic guys when they're taller especially it can be really easy to overshoot blocking angles play lopsided in space right you know being controlled even when you're athletic is very tough but Roderick Jones you know I'll give him credit you know the pass protection needs to improve but you mentioned it and I absolutely agree the run blocking on day one he really provides an upgrade and especially for Najee Harris you know wanting to improve his efficiency this year you know I really think that's a you know I can see that I'm excited for that yeah and I just think you know I've tried to tell people too you know this Roderick Jones pick man like it, it's not a pick for 2023 like whatever you get as a rookie, you know, especially as a pass blocker, you know, if, if it's good, that's just a bonus for me. That's the cherry mm-hmm. on top. Like I think that the Steelers are, um, you know, I, I'm a fan of taking big swings in, in the first round. And when you get a guy with this type of upside, that's, that's why I'm able to get on board because, you know, here two to three years from now, um, even though there is like a notable floor with him and he's not the safest prospect, like you mentioned, you know, there, there's definitely things that are concerning uh, with him and pass pro, but this is a guy who could, massively just outplay his draft position even at pick 14 because he could be a top five top 10 left tackle in the national football league and we know how just insanely valuable that is so mm-hmm. um yeah when i was going through and putting together the Roger jones film room uh the day after the night they drafted him i just kept seeing big number zero on the same side of the field and this is before obviously the steelers picked him and i knew that there was a chance it could happen because they brought him in for a late top 30 visit and uh i was like man i I could really do this like on a weekly basis in the fall i could really get down to watch these two just absolutely maul guys at the line of scrimmage so um let's let's move on let's talk a little bit about joey porter jr man um you know what were your thoughts on him uh just throughout the process i know i know we talked a lot about corners you know just in twitter dms and just different guys um you know christian gonzalez guys like that but what how did porter stack up with the rest of this class for you yeah so originally earlier on in the process he was a little bit higher for me he was in that mm-hmm. top 20 range but then as the process went on a little bit more we rewatched him and banks and i did feel that banks was a little bit smoother as an athlete for his size i thought he channeled his explosiveness and speed a little bit better on the field you know porter tested very well but you know i didn't always see that elite explosiveness out of transitions for him sometimes mm-hmm. it takes a little bit longer for him to unhinge uh so that kind of drew him down but i think you know, especially at 32, man, I think that was the optimal value to take him, right? You know, you saw some mocks taking him at 16 overall. It's like, if you can get him at 32, that's a win. And they did it. So I, I that was phenomenal. You know, uh, the legacy aspect aside, I mean, that's kind of a fun bonus here. But I mean, six foot two and three, four, someone said or he's somewhere in that six, two, six, three range, but he's got 34 inch arms. I mean, the guy, the guy is, you know, gangly out there. I mean, he's so long, you know, he's so physical too with the line, you know, just that reach can be smothering for wide receivers. And, you know, he, I think he can clean up his technique, both with the footwork and the hand usage, you know, the precision with the strikes. He sometimes kind of grazes guys kind of, you know, kind of shoves past them. Right. I'd rather, you know, make sure that you kind of hone in on that placement and then with his footwork too you know sometimes the controlled aspect of it can improve as well and there are times when he's a little leggy you know you know sometimes he can get tied up a little bit because you know he's not the best in terms of his fluidity and short area agility but you know he is very good for size i will say that and if you need him to turn 90 degrees and run with guys upfield he's got the long strider athleticism to do that um, he's got great ball skills. You know, he can hone in on the ball in the air. He can kind of contort and then use that flexibility. And then, you know, at the same time, too, you know, I think he's shown that he can react quickly. You know, I think that's not the issue. I think he's got the processing ability, the reaction to stimulus at the line. I think it's just cleaning up some little things in his technique. But he can be very, very good. I wanted to see a little bit more in run support, too, for a guy with his length. But, you know, I do think he's got the physicality to translate there. So, overall, you know, I think you're working with a guy who's got the passable athleticism, good fluidity for his size. And, again, that 
that physicality, that length on the on the boundary. That's something that, again, you set the tone and it kind of increases your disruption radius in all phases. Yeah. And I was in, on the same page with Banks. Uh, he ended up grading a little bit higher than Porter Jr. did for me. I think Banks was the 13th player on my big board. Porter ended up coming in around 17th. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with Porter, man, I'm glad that you brought that up with the um, the footwork, um, you know, at the line of scrimmage. Like that was kind of the, the big hang up for me. I see a lot of false steps on, on, on film, you know, just – uh, putting himself in some compromising positions that he doesn't yeah. need to get himself into. You know, there there are times where, you know, he's not even reacting necessarily to jab steps uh, to either direction. Like he's just taking false steps just out of, you know, habit. And um, for me, when I watch him at the line of scrimmage, like even though he wins a, a lot of reps and he has that link to just suffocate wide receivers, you know, he's got offensive tackle length, um, which is crazy. But, you know, there's just there's so much room for improvement. I think in terms of his te technique, you know, honing down on like his footwork, um, but also like his strike placement, like you mentioned, um, you know, there are just two hand jams or just massive, just swings. It almost looks like uh, talk about like targeting system. It almost looks like sometimes like his targeting system with his hands or length is just mm -hmm. a little bit off kilter. Yeah. Um, and he'll and just be all over the place. I think over aggression could be an issue with it. Right. Yeah. You know, he, he's so overzealous when it comes to making contact and you'd like to have that mentality from a corner, but at the same time, you need to be able to channel it effectively and efficiently. So I think he's still working on that for sure. And with the two hand jams, it's dangerous because if you levy two hand jam, you know, at the wrong time, you lock your hips out and that can delay your transition upfield and then you're working from behind. So especially yeah. with him, you know, where he did test with elite explosiveness, but I don't always see it upfield, you know, making up space. So Mm -hmm. You know, I think he can can continue to glean that with his technique and everything. And I think, you know, the, the ceiling is definitely high, but, you know, you, there is some work to do for sure. Yeah, I think with Porter, too, when I went back and watched him, because he was a he was a guy that I actually remember tweeting out. I was like, hey, like, I need you to give me the film, like give me the mm -hmm. film that Sojal and Joey Porter Jr. Because I was seeing like, you know, early in the process, I was seeing mock drafts and it's like he's not even making it to 17. And I'm like. Mm -hmm. I just don't see I don't I don't see him as like a top 15 prospect in this class right now. Um, so I went back and watched some more. And I, the more I watched, the more I kind of saw it, because I like kind of like Roger Jones, like he was making technical mistakes like with his footwork, or with his hands, but still winning reps in spite of that. And I, it was starting to get me on board. But also, like, I also thought that um, you mentioned like those transitions from press, like uh, carrying guys vertically and things like that. I actually think his hips are pretty fluid for a taller corner i don't know if you'd agree with that or not but i think they are um, yeah i think it's more technical inefficiencies that will hang him up at times but i do yeah. think he has the fluidity and even though i don't think that he has that elite recovery ability i think it's good enough and i think that um something we really don't talk a lot about with corners but recovery length is almost the thing with him because oh, yeah, sure. even when his foot speed isn't necessarily always um good enough to get him out of those compromising positions the length in terms of just getting back into passing lanes is elite elite and that was something too um you know a lot's been made about the the lack of ball production and i completely get it you know in today's nfl it's nearly impossible to stop these elite quarterbacks you know you need to turn the ball over and i'm not sure that Porter Jr. is ever going to be that elite playmaker that you're looking for on the boundary. But this dude locates the ball. Like, mm -hmm. it's it's a little bit different for Banks. Like, Banks, when I was watching him, that was one of my big hangups with him was, like, you know, he just would not flip his head around and get his head back around to the football. There was times where, you know, he would be beat and he would do a good job, you know, getting himself back into phase. But, like, he left turnovers on the field because he wasn't locating the football. Porter mm -hmm. Jr., he was locating the ball. It's just he was going after deflections. You know, he had that dropped pick against Purdue where he was the cover two uh, cloud corner, and he jumps that, and it just hits him right in the hands and just falls right to the turf. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if he's a playmaker, but I do think, you know, he gets his hand on the football even for being a guy that was largely avoided. That was another thing. Like, he, they avoided him like the plague this past season at Penn mm -hmm. State. I mean, Kalen King – ended up getting a ton of reps like yep. we have a ton of really good tape to go off uh for him next cycle because yeah, he, he was the targeting he had crazy 15, yeah but it's because you know after that first game against purdue where joey porter just smothered charlie jones man it's like all right <laughs> we're going the other way but yeah. um yeah it's fun and i think the, the the fun thing with porter is that you know when he is working with his face to the ball right like on, on digs and stuff like that and slants mm -hmm. you know he has the length to really you know, wrap around and disrupt the cage either either way, even when he's working from behind. You know, I think that in itself is very valuable too. 
Yeah. Yeah. He's going to be a difficult dude to uh, throw that underneath stuff. Like you talk about um, like all these RPOs and stuff that, you know, the NFL um, landscape has kind of shifted towards, you know, he's going to be a diff- difficult dude to throw those because, you know, he's like you said, he's going to be able to reach from behind and uh, disrupt uh, throws in the passing lanes. Um, let's, let's move on to Keanu Benton, man. This, this was a dude that, um, you know, all draft cycle, I kept hammering, you know, Keanu Ben just feels like a Steeler, you know, and mm-hmm. I even I know you don't necessarily just cover the Steelers. You cover all the NFL teams. Uh, but Benton, to me, just he just fits so many uh, of the Steeler characteristics, checks so many boxes. Um, what, what did you think about Benton through the pre-draft process? Like what kind of grade did you have on him and just some of the things that you liked that you saw on tape? Yeah, for sure. And uh, my defensive tackle grading, that's something I'm going to revisit this coming cycle because guys like Benton, Mozzie Smith, for instance, like Mm -hmm. didn't grade as highly for me initially. And I didn't have a ton of time to regrade at the very end of it. But I was looking back and I was reevaluating. and I was like, I mean, I feel like I didn't do them justice. Right. And Benton Mm -hmm. is one of those guys. Right. I think, you know, he's got a lot of what you want uh, for a guy who can play one tech or three tech. Right. You know, I think that disruptive three tech is probably where he fits better, but he can slide into one tech if you need him to, you know, six, four, three, 10, 34 inch arms. Right. So, again, natural leverage, proportional length. And this is a guy who, you know, some of his best reps were in run defense, you know, the stack and shed that he can do. Like, Mm -hmm. I mean, he's so good at locking out and then ripping anchors down with that power, with that strength. Uh, and then at the same time, too, the flashes and as a pass rusher, too, uh, very exciting. I mean, this guy is his arm over has been just completely unraveling offensive linemen in the Big Ten since like, you know, 2020 going back that far, man. But especially down the stretch in 2022, uh, I mean, that explosiveness off the line. You know, I do think he can be a little stiff in the hips sometimes, but I do think the lateral agility is there to work across face and invade gaps, too. And then he just has clubs for hands, man. I mean, if he gets his hands on in the right spot, he can channel that power. He can send linemen lurching and he's got a very good motor in pursuits, too. So I think, you know, stacking and shedding, maintaining positioning and run defense, you know, being a disruptor in the pass rushing game, too. Uh, I think he's got all of that talent there. So I was a big fan of that pick, I think, especially for the Steelers who needed need a little bit more reliability in the interior mm-hmm. rotation. You know, I think Ben still has some things to clean up, but right away with his physical profile and his three down ability, uh, I think he provides some very good value for you. And on top of that, too, there's still room for him to keep growing as a pass rusher. Yeah, you talked about the motor, man. Like that that was something, you know, the Steelers defensive line lineage. You know, you look at Cam Hayward, Stephon Tuitt, guys like that. They've always just played with that red hot motor that never stops, you know, sideline to sideline, chasing plays down from behind. And I see that with Benton. Um, you talked about the club, man. Dude, that club yeah. swim. I mean, I I don't I don't think he's a very refined pass rusher because I think that he really only at this point has one move it's club swim club arm over that's pretty much it but um dude it's dangerous i mean he gave minnesota and he gave minnesota the business with that move i mean he just he spams it over and over and over and i do think um with with his hand usage you know there's flashes of quickness up the field being disruptive as a pass rusher i'm excited about what he could potentially become um and then as a run defender you mentioned um just when he gets the opportunity to work one-on-one i mean his hands are incredibly powerful. You know, he can lock out, he can shed. Um, he, he's a difficult dude to sustain blocks against, uh, par- partially because of that motor. Like he just, he doesn't give up uh, easily on plays. But I wanted to talk to you about, um, this is something because I'm in the process of doing the clips for the Benton film room. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wanted your take on this, but um, to me, I do think he's more of a three tech rather than nose tackle. Like what I saw on film uh, was, you know, he, when he was uh, trying to, you know, go up against double teams uh, from offensive linemen, you know, he, his leverage is constantly high. In my opinion, I think he plays a little too high. And even when he does play with good leverage, I do think that he struggles to kind of quickly transition to that anchor with his post foot. um, And guys can kind of just generate a little bit too much displacement. And I think at at nose tackle, it's a little bit more difficult to um, overcome that rather than that as a three tech, because you're going to see more, especially in an odd front, like the Steelers have, you're going to see more double teams uh so i wanted your kind of take on that like like something you agree with or you know um what what did you see on film with that yeah you know coming into the evaluation i was thinking you know okay this guy's a guy who can potentially play nose tackle but looking at you know not only i think the leverage was a big issue for me you know he's a little high hipped i think Mm -hmm. you see you know he's long limbed he's got the long arms 34 inch arms too but you know he's high hipped and that can cause him to divert upright a lot you know it's kind of tough for him to mitigate that in the heat of the moment so i think that was an issue that that popped up for me and then the mass too i mean at 310 pounds i just don't think you have quite enough mass to eat those double teams consistently especially at the nfl level so those those two things combined you know i think you know he might this isn't a comp at all but one player um career arc that 
could he could be similar to you know as in terms of you know a draft prospect who some mm-hmm. people liken to a nose tackle but eventually became a disruptive three tech is Elim McNeil from the Lions who's kind of taken that three tech okay. role for them uh you know and he's got the mass and the length to be very very violent in that role right you know a little bit more mass and length than you would expect from a three tech but still in that role I think that is probably the arc that Ben takes where you can play three tech that's probably where you want him most often I do think he can line up inside of one tech occasionally play the matchups right but let him be you know that one gap guy for sure you know i think he's he's you know his, his traits are very 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 translatable in that phase i think yeah yeah for sure i, I like ben a lot um just as a player I, he's not someone that i think has a uh you know we've talked about kind of the ceilings with uh porter but especially project jones like he's he's not the type of prospect where i'm looking for an extremely high ceiling like i think he's a good athlete um, i think he has a potential you know definitely be a starter in the league i don't know that i see like a super high ceiling um, I could be end up being wrong on that, but I think that Benton has a pretty good floor uh, mm-hmm. because of some of the things that he can already offer you um, yeah. as a rookie. So um, probably the most, I don't know, maybe the biggest like fan favorite pick uh, for the Steelers. Uh, one more thing on Benton too. Like I think they could be saying that they're going to start him at nose tackle because the Steelers don't have like a – certified starter at that position right now. You know, they brought in Brandon for Hoko. Um, they've got some other guys, you know, still on the roster, you know, they've been employing uh, Montrevious Adams there, but with Hayward and Oka Joby kind of slotted in as you're starting three techs, it could just be, okay, this is, we, we've seen him do it at Wisconsin, a familiar front. We've seen him play nose tackle. This is just a way for us to get him on the field on early mm-hmm. downs. And then we'll rotate him in, you know, at three tech, some two eye stuff when they go in sub package football. So um, I think that could be, a potential uh, part in it but I think it's Cam Hayward you know he's getting a little long in the tooth you know he's not gonna be able to defend uh, or fend off father time forever so I think mm-hmm. that that could be a natural transition um, maybe even next year or the year after so excited about that but uh, like I said the fan favorite pick was Darnell Washington man I, I could not believe that he was still on the board at 93 um, you know wh- what did you think about uh, Washington's fall um and and is that uh was was that you know in your mind that he could potentially be a guy that f- fell into like the late day two kind of range it wasn't in my mind i thought the nfl would like him a lot but at the mm-hmm. same time i think we heard that uh medicals, medicals. may have played mm-hmm. a part yeah so and actually the 80 to 90 range was where he was valued on my board so it aligned a little bit more with that you okay. know i'm i'm very high on the potential for sure i mean the size and length and just the dominating profile. I mean, that's what stands out first, right? And the blocking ability too. I mean, this guy is an elite blocker. Essentially, you know, you hear people say an extra offensive tackle on the field. You know, it's essentially accurate with him. I mean, he's got, you know, incredible core strength, very, very good driving ability too with his frame. He can just wall guys off, you know, and he's very, very physical as a finisher too. He can drive uh, plow lanes open with that leg drive and strength. And, you know, he's athletic too. You know, that, you know, that's obvious from the testing numbers too. So I think right away, the things that you can do with him as a blocker you know as we mentioned with jones earlier you know versatility you know multiplicity too but then just the strength and resolve to finish right you know that's just as important he's got that too um the big hang up for me was his translatability as a receiver you know i Mm -hmm. think he's got the length for sure you know i think the run after catchability is as advertised you know not quite as advertised but i mean he's he's a bull in space i mean he's very tough to take down you can't take him down with one solo tackler and he's got decent he's actually got surprising athleticism when he's in a straight line right you know he can hurdle guys he's got that speed uh when he's able to open up his strides but you know i didn't see a guy with very easy change of direction or sink right and that was a little concerning to me especially when you're projecting a separator at the next level you know i think you're gonna have to scheme him touches early on you know i think you're gonna have to you know get him open in the flats right and let him work as a runoff catch threat you know, in the red zone as well. I like his utility there. But even then, you know, he, he's got the wingspan and, and the play strength, but he can be a clap catcher sometimes where he's going to bring the hands together, you know, a little too late. You know, I want to I want to see more diamond technique from him. And again, he's got massive hands. I mean, he, he you saw that one clip in, from the combine where he just snared yeah. it with one hand. Right. So, you know, the tools are insane for sure. But I think technically. You know, there's some ways for him to keep improving to kind of, you know, grow into that image that people have of him. And then as a route runner, too, you know, I think he is a little too upright lumbering as a mover for me to project a ton of growth there. So I think, you know, but at the end of the day, if you get a elite run blocker, a solid run after catch threat in the flats and the short range and a red zone threat is worth it. Yeah. You know, as a tight end, too, you know, that's a lot. You know, that's something I'm willing to bank on. So, you know, I think. You know, people looked at the RAS and they're like, this guy's got generational upside. It doesn't quite translate on the field all the time, but I do think there is a a very confined role for him where he can be successful. 
Yeah, for sure. Uh, I like what you said too. Like, you know, not just being like a sixth offensive tack or, you know, a, another offensive tackle, but six offensive linemen, but yeah. you know, just the way he can operate like as a force multiplier in the run game. I mean, like this dude, you get him on double teams, allow him to climb to the second level, you know, get out of the perimeter. I mean, he is just an absolute alien in space. And I really like that about his game. Um, one of the things that I, I want to see from him is, I do agree that he's so stiff as a route runner, and I don't think that that's something that's necessarily going to change um, at the next level. But I want to see – we didn't get a lot of contested catch uh, opportunities in that Georgia offense. You know, he was – you know, he just wasn't one of their premier weapons, uh, wasn't focused on in the game plan. I want to see in the red zone if that translates at the next level because, like you said, um, as a tight end too, like the things that he can do as a run blocker, um, there's value in that. But I want – if we're talking about upside as a receiver, where is that upside going to come from? You know, and I, I, I don't have the answer to that. I do think he's a good run after catch threat. You know, guys, especially smaller defensive backs that are going low on him, he just – you know, plows right through them, you know, yeah. the leg drive and stuff like that. But I wanted to know, like, kind of, um, you know, as far as like some of the things that you can do with him, I mentioned, you know, going 12 personnel, uh, things like that, you know, what are, if you were an offensive coordinator and you were, you know, to get your hands on a guy like Darnell Washington, like, what do you think is the best utilization of him or how some, what are some of the ways you can get creative with him um, early on in his career? Mm-hmm. Well, obviously, the things that he can do is a run blocker. And, and the good thing is that on tape at Georgia, you know, they basically you exhausted that to the full amount. So, mm-hmm. you know, you've kind of seen what you can do. You can pull him from right to left. You know, you can get him in space. Like you mentioned, you know, you can have him chip defensive linemen and climb up the field and just smother defensive backs and just plow open lanes, you know, rotate out, kind of hinge out like that. You know, I think there's a lot of different things that you can do with him. As a run blocker, you know, I think you could even line him up in line and just let his power take over you know, as a lead blocker for you. So I think, you know, especially with all those aspects, you know, that's how I would use him. I would I would say, you know, in regards to how to use him as a blocker, just get creative and, and try not to put a, a ceiling on him. Or try not to put a lid on it because there are so many ways that you can use that straight line athleticism and that power. Um, and then as a, as a receiver, you know, again, I would probably get him the ball in the flats, right? Try and scheme ways for him to get open underneath, right? Because then, you know, even as a rack threat, you know, he's not the most agile guy. He's more of a straight mm-hmm. line runner, right? So, you know, get him space where he can open up and really get churning because once he does, man, he's a freight train. So it's like, you know, get him opportunities to do that. And then obviously run red zone opportunities, right? You know, goal line phase, you know, stuff, stuff like that from the inline position, right? You know, I think, He's got to refine his hand technique again because the clap catching comes up a little too much right. for me. But I do think the length, the the wingspan as well. Once he refines that, I mean, it's really tough to go against that in the red zone. I mean, that's a guy who is a mismatch against defensive backs, against linebackers. I mean, if you can just get the ball to the highest point, he's the guy who's going to get it, right? It's just a matter of can he haul it in? Can he right. secure it, right? So I think that'll be a really good utility for him once he refines that. I want to see more refinement, but, you know, very, very versatile run blocker very imposing run after catch threat in the vertical plane and a red zone threat. I think that's kind of your, your framework for Donald Washington. Yeah. And the Steelers, the good thing about that is like, you know, Washington, you know, adding him in, into the fold in the red zone, you know, they've added a guy like Allen Robinson as well. Another guy who has literally made a career out of making, you know, above the rim type catches. And then of course you got George Pickens, who was, you know, one of the NFL's best contested catch threats uh, last season. So I think, all in all, you know, they've got the weapons to be an improving uh, red zone team next year. Um, let's talk a little bit about Nick Herbig, uh, edge rusher from Wisconsin. You know, a lot of people were projecting him, you know, to make a move to off ball linebacker. But it seems like the Steelers are at least going to try him at edge rusher, um, you know, to start off with. You know, my thoughts on Herbig, you know, just an electric first step, very sudden mover, um, speed rusher through and through. Like loves to win the outside shoulder, gets vertically, you know, with with the swiftness, mm-hmm. uh, but has some inside counters. I was impressed with like the pass rushing. Uh, plan, but what what did you see from Herbig? Was he a guy that you um, you know projected as an off ball linebacker? I know that's t- kind of tough because we don't really have any reps of him doing that. Uh, but how do you see Herbig at the next level? Like, what what do you see his role being? Yeah, so I saw him as the edge. You know, I think that's because okay. just stylistically, I think that's where he translates best. I mean, you mentioned it; he's going to be a speed rusher through and through. And you know, part mm-hmm. of that is he's got thirty one you know, arms under thirty two inches, right? right? He's only around six two, two forty five, right? So he's going to be a speed rusher, right? But I, I think especially for the Steelers, right? You know, I was trying to pinpoint guys who could be that really good third edge for you behind T.J. Watt and Alex Highsmith, and 
And Nick Herbig was high on that list around day three. That was a great ad for you. Um, but yeah, you mentioned it very quick off the line. He's got great speed and explosiveness. He's got good bend too. You know, I think if you're gonna if you're gonna win around the arc, you kind of need to have that ankle flexion sure. to get under. Um, and he's got that. He's got the speed to beat the tackle to the apex, the bend to get under and penetrate the pocket too. But then on top of that too, you know, he's shown that he can string together pass rush moves and multitask while bending around the edge. I think that's very good. And I think part of the reason he can work outside to inside is because working across face, he's very um very opportunistic when it comes to using his hands to swat away extensions, right? You know, he's not the most powerful guy with his knockback force, but, you know, he's very technically refined for his size. And I think that helps him uh, with that. So I think, you know, again, without the elite length and power capacity, the ceiling is going to be a little lower for you. But if you need a speed rusher who can be that spark plug off the edge, he can do that. And then I do think he he's shown that he can at least drop out to the flats sometimes from that position too. Again, I don't think off ball, you know, inside linebackers really in his future, but if you need him to, right, you know, if there's a tight end sneaking out, you know, he can at least do that as well. So, you know, I think a very able speed rusher in that rotation kind of provides that spark. And again, you know, has a little bit of inbuilt versatility for you. But yeah, I, I'd want him to pin his ears back and attack. That's kind of how I would use him most. Yeah, I think like just what it does, man, like you think about, you know, TJ Watt, Alex Highsmith, those guys are going to need a breather. But, you know, last year in the in the recent years, you know, when those guys have had to come off the field or they've been injured, like offensive tackles were kind of able to get real relaxed. You know, the Steelers haven't had those threats behind them. But I feel like with Herbig, at least with his first step, you know, offensive tackles, even if they know they're getting a speed rush, it's still a matter of like, OK, I have got to get to my landmark before yeah. this dude gets there. And even he's then going he's below by me. He's so low, too. Right. Yeah. So, you know, getting to that position to, you know, get hands on him, it's tough because he's got Ben too. Right. But he's also so low to the ground. You know, these offensive tackles are going to be lurching, trying to, you know, kind of lurch beyond their center of gravity, mm -hmm. get him off balance and you can capitalize on that. So it puts you in a tough position, especially when you're gassed facing Watt and Heisman. Yeah. And last thing on Herbig, like for me, I was trying to come up with a comp for him because uh, he's so, such a unique guy. I mean, I think Wisconsin had him listed like 220 to or 225 228 yeah. range i mean he and he looks it on on film too he looks light like you said he doesn't have that that power capacity even even when he does uh establish like first contact with his hand usage um you know he's not he's not a guy that's able to just run through the middle of you um is there a, is there a comp that you like maybe for herbig or is there there is edge rusher that you've studied in recent years that kind of wins in a similar way because my, my thing with him and this is something i highlighted in the video on the channel is just that, you know, there were times where he was able to get the offensive tackles turning to where they're like basically sprinting out because he's already gotten by them, you know, hitting that landmark. Uh, but then when he would get them turned, where like most, uh, you know, elite edge rushers that went with speed, what they're going to do is, you know, take that long arm, put it through the offensive tackles chest because they're already off balance, right? And they're just yeah. driving back to the quarterback. When he tries to do that, it just – the 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 power just fizzles out like there's just nothing behind his hands and i just don't think he's overly powerful is there a rusher that's that you can remember kind of in a similar way or somebody that wins like that and it did it improve at the next level off the top no no i'll be i'll be like i haven't been doing this for super long sure. right only a few years so i don't have a huge sample size to go off of you know a few you know, the names that come to mind for me are designated pass rushers. Like, we know we right. saw James Houston last year really emerge with the Lions. But even then, yeah. I think he had a little more mass, a little more length, too. So, you know, he obviously, a lot of his sacks came from speed and bend, being able yeah. to get under guys, too. But, you know, I think just having a little bit of power in your corner can really help. And, you know, Herbig is pretty minimal in that aspect right, right now. What he does have, he has a lot of, you know, the speed, the bend, the agility, the finesse, and, you know, the hand refinement, too. I think, you know, with if you're, if you're that small, you know, you need to be able to string together moves and kind of stack those pass rush encounters. And he can do that. He can multitask. Um, I think it's going to be tough for him to sustain production. But I do think, you know, just looking at what he provides in that rotation, it's a valuable thing, you know, right. projecting it. You know, I want to see him hopefully, you know, getting work in the NFL weight room can kind of improve that power. Again, mm -hmm. I think with arms that are in the 31, 32 inch range, it's going to be tough because just right. arm length is part of that component of power capacity, right? If you have shorter arms, you can't drive as much force into contact. So that'll just be something that he'll have to counteract consistently, right? But I do think uh, having the speed and bend is valuable. So there's not uh, there's not a comp that comes to mind for me because he is such an outlier in that regard. But I do think what he does provide, you know, there is some projection that you can do. 
Yeah, for sure. And like like I said, uh, even if even if it is as a third edge rusher, I mean, you're, this this is the fourth round pick we're talking about. So like, it's not a significant investment. Even if he's always just kind of like part of a rotation, I think what he does bring to the table, like just from an athleticism standpoint, it, it's definitely worth the pick. Um, I definitely want to get to Corey Trice. I know I am uh, over the moon with this selection. Uh, he was in my top one hundred. But I'm pretty sure he was way higher for you than he was for me. Uh, Nick Martin, you know, the co-host for my um, my Steelers draft talk podcast on the All Steelers Network, um, was really high on Trice as well. I have got to get your thoughts on Corey Trice and, uh, you know, how, how big of tell, – tell everybody how big of a steal this was. It was a huge steal, man. I swear. I was like – and part of me was kind of tempering my expectations. Like, I was thinking, all right, he'll probably – he might hit the undrafted pool because he had a season-ending knee injury in his history. So, I thought mm-hmm. medicals might push him there. And then the Steelers got him. I was like, let's go. <laughs> hey, hey, let's – I was pretty hyped, man. I know Nick had him in his top 50, man. I had him in my top 100, too. So, I was a big fan. Uh, he caught my eye. I think before the season ending injury, it was, mm-hmm. I was reviewing like the 2020 tape and uh, you know, just the fluidity off the line. I mean, he turns and he's just running with guys at six, three, two Oh six. I was like, okay, this guy's got, you know, he's, he's basically on a swivel out there, man. And then, you know, you look at the tape this past year too. Uh, he really came back at a hundred percent from that injury. You know, I love to see him recover from that, but then you know, just, the size, the physicality at the line, man. You know, I think the scheme versatility that you can bring this guy into is very, very exciting because, you know, he's got the physicality to kind of set the tone, kind of dictate reps to the line. He can be a little overzealous at times, kind of similar to Porter. Mm-hmm. He'll sell out with those two-hand jams. You know, I think I think Trice is even more fluid to recover. You know, that's the thing that excites me with him. But, you know, you can refine that a little bit more. Um, I don't think he quite plays that four four seven speed all the time. Right. You know, there are times that he gets beat deep, but you know, he does have good explosiveness out of his transitions. Again, you know, he can track the ball very well. I think, you know, he's one of he he's one of the better corners in the class when it comes to really contorting, you know, extending beyond his frame and timing those extensions to the catch point too. Uh, so that was fun. You know, I think he improved a little bit more in run support this past year, showing that physicality downhill. Uh, but just, yeah, I think the coverage toolbox that you're working with is very fun. For a 6'3", 205 guy, you don't expect him to be as fluid and as free of a mover that he is. And he's physical. You know, he's a playmaker at the catch point. You know, he's got good eyes in the zone, too, where he can kind of peel off, drop back, and kind of undercut routes, too. So, you know, I'm a big fan, man. I think if he can stay healthy, you you might have a starting tandem right there. You know, I, yeah. I don't want to jump ahead. But, you know, he was a round two, round three player that dropped because of medicals. And the Steelers ended up getting a massive steal, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, you talked about, like, just the ability to peel off in zone coverage. Like, I, I think back to, like, the Maryland game from this past season. He had an yeah. excellent interception, you know, kind of just dropping in zone coverage. Uh undercutting a pick um but you know like for me just i watch a lot of corners uh every cycle because it's like my favorite position to scout mm-hmm. um me and you talk about corners all the time uh and you know when you look at guys that test this way and you know the testing matches what you see on film for the most part i do agree that um i was a little bit taken aback by the 447 i thought he was you know four or five guy yeah. um but i thought for the most part like the agility numbers that he put up at his pro day i thought that you know for a bigger corner like he moves really well he changes directions really well you see that uh when he's defending like stops and comebacks and stuff like that you mentioned the ability to you know swivel his hips and get downhill he can really really do that at a high level um guys that test like that that are that athletic and then have the film that he does, they are not ever. And I say this ever available at that point in the draft. I mean, that's how I just, this is the guy that who had, you know, day two film day two, probably day one. athleticism. He was was one of my, my best guys available entering day three. Like I was like, all right, early round, early round four, who's going to take Corey Trice. We get to round five. Who's going to take Corey Trice, man, round six? Uh, is, all right, this is getting absurd. Come on, like someone someone take a chance on this guy because, you know, even with the medicals, right, the talent is just, you know, it's so immense. You kind of have to, especially in round seven. I mean, the risk is almost none. You know, the potential payoff is massive. You know, I feel like teams, if he does stay healthy, teams could really regret passing on him. Yeah, totally agree, man. Uh, before I get you out of here, last player. Uh, Spencer Anderson from Maryland, you know, a guy who's played all over the offensive line. And we talk about, you know, guys that are going to get drafted late. Uh, They need to be able to play multiple positions, have that positional versatility, uh, because, you know, if you're a backup, you know, it's really hard to make a living at the NFL level if you only know how to play one position or one side. And that's one thing that Anderson can do. He can play both sides. You know, he's a little ambidextrous in that regard. Uh, You know, what did you – he was the only player that the Steelers drafted that I hadn't seen, you Mm -hmm. know, a lot of tape on he was the the only player that was outside my top 100 uh but what what did you see from uh spencer anderson 
Yeah, for sure. Solid pick this late. You know, I, I didn't watch quite as much of him as I did mm-hmm. other players. But again, I mean, 6'5", 308. I think he ran a f- in the 5'1 range at a 30 and a half inch vertical, right? So again, he's a very Tested good athlete. Very well. You know, he's a very good short area athlete. And for that size too, he's 6'5", 308. But at the Shrine Bowl, man, I got to see him in one-on-ones. And he looks like he's, you know, he looks like the part of a center. He looks like he can play that. Like he looks almost 6'3", 300 out there because he's just very good at bending his knees, acquiring proper leverage too. So, you know, I think, that ability to acquire leverage at his size he's got fairly you know he's got over 32 inch arms so again not elite length but again he's shown that he can at least generate some knockback power right you know he's got pretty good core strength too so i think he's a guy who can be positionally versatile for you i think at that point in round seven just getting offensive line depth a guy who can play multiple spots that's valuable right i think that was the one thing that i was looking for from the steelers you know all right you've hit everything you know just get a guy who can you know kind of shore up that line a little bit more because there is still some uncertainty there I think Spencer Anderson does a great job with that. So round seven, I'm I'm all over that for sure. Yeah, I think for me, and I don't know exactly how it's going to play out in the long run, but I think you know getting a guy like him with that type of short area athleticism, change of direction, um, you know, guy who can get really get out of a stance, um, mm-hmm. would like to see him given the chance to play some center um, in in training camp and in, through the preseason, just because I think that that's one position that the Steelers could potentially upgrade. You know, they spend a lot of time on interior offensive lineman prospects throughout the process, guys that have that center capability. Um, and Anderson, I, I, I like it as like a cheap flyer. Um, but yeah, before we get out of here, I got to ask you one more question. So I'm just going to put you on the spot here. Um, I think the Steelers biggest need, if I had to guess right now, entering 2024 is probably going to be edge rusher. I know that the draft ended less than a week ago, and I know that you've already watched like 300 prospects in a week. I I need you to give me what edge rusher you want to see on the Pittsburgh Steelers next year in in round one. Shoot, man. I mean, it's tough. I think next year. It's tough. The edge class next year, man, after Jared Verse, it's not a ton of established talent. So I'm excited to see. I think that there's going to be a lot of progression. The guy who's fresh in my mind right now, I was watching some of him this morning, is Alabama's Dallas Turner, uh, 6'4", 245. Oh, yeah. So I think he, you know, when you think of the Steelers, you know, guys who can rush from space outside the tackle, I mean, this guy is explosive. He's bendy. I saw one rep against uh, Kansas State, I want to say, where he actually started as you know in at the second level. You know, he's kind of rushing from the field and he still won around the tackle in under three seconds because he just exploded downhill, used that ankle flexion to just see around the corner and accelerate. So he's got that. You know, he's got that legit. But then also I think he's got almost 34 inch arms comparing him to Will Anderson. I think it's pretty close. I think Anderson might be just a little bit longer, but he's got length, man. He's got speed to power uh against LSU. There was one play where he kind of started vertical up the field and then surged inside and just long armed the guy and just knocked him off balance and he was stumbling for three or four yards. So he's got a power profile, man. For his for his finesse and explosiveness, you don't expect it. It really catches you off guard. But he's got a lot of the tools, man. I'm excited to see how he can develop. I think he'll be he'll be the front runner for me. There's a few others that could be in consideration. Uh, Florida's princely Uman Milan is a potential option if he can take the leap. He's got another. He's got. You know, his first step, it really stands out. I mean, he explodes off the line quicker than anyone on the Florida front. He's got great length, too. So, you know, there's some traits rich guys. But I think right now the front runner for me, if you are the Steelers, if you're picking that high, Dallas Turner's got to be the top of the list. Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited about Turner, man. Like uh, you you mentioned a couple of specific examples. I always go back to that Texas A&M game. Dude, that Texas A&M game from last year, dude, he just yeah. he was taking over mm-hmm. um and that one i think he, i'm just looking at some of the box score numbers right now uh he finished with seven pressures two sacks two quarterback hits three hurries um three stops against the run i mean he was just all over the place mm-hmm. and you know those flashes um you know we saw a lot of that from will anderson like when he was an underclassman you know we, he was a guy that we've known about we knew about for a long time before he declared and uh i, I see similar kind of future uh in dallas turner i think he's going to be you know a top top 10 top 15 type of talent um next year i'm really excited you know alex hasmith i I definitely don't want to kind of wish him away i just think that he's going to get paid to the point where uh the steelers might have a little hesitation about paying you know two edge rushers you know 50 million but Mm -hmm. overall man i really appreciate you joining me um everybody please make sure you got to go follow ian's draft content go hit him up on twitter at ic underscore draft um and it's been a pleasure brother i appreciate you joining me one more time yes sir thanks for having me it's always a pleasure yeah brother